Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Columbus Marketing Show. I am your host, Nate Riggs, and we are delighted for another great show today. Last week, we had the chance to talk with Brett Scotto of Aimpoint Research, all about market research and its ties to intelligence. Brett's background is actually in the military, so go back and make sure you check out that episode. It was a very compelling discussion. This week, we are tackling something that is on the mind of just about every executive uh, probably in the world today, and that is really the ties between marketing and sales. We're going to get into the root causes of what has historically been known as a disconnect, as well as why it's so important to unite these two entities, and we'll also talk about some strategies and tactics for really bridging the gap between sales and marketing. Our guest today is Ray Taylor, who is a sales and marketing strategy consultant. He has over 18 years of sales experience and has had numerous positions in some very large companies, including Standard Register, Signature Worldwide, and BI Worldwide. He's also a member of the Sales and Marketing Executives Association and sits on Ohio University's Shea Sales uh, Center's Advisory Board. He was also named to the Cambridge Who's Who in 2008. Welcome to the show, Ray. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for, uh, for being here. We're going to be back with Ray and more from him right after these messages. The Columbus Marketing Show is a production of NR Media Group. We change the way businesses understand and use digital media to connect with customers, earn their trust, and win their business for life. Learn more at nrmedia.biz. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and this week's Marketing Insights is an interesting tie. According to Marketo's 2013 Sales and Marketing Alignment Study, alignment between marketing and sales can help your company become 67% better at closing deals and generate up to 209% more revenue from marketing. We'll get into this more detail later, but in your opinion, Ray, why is alignment between sales and marketing so important? And then a follow-up question to that is, why do so many companies struggle with it? Yeah, I think it might be easier to answer the second one first. There's so many p companies struggle with it because it's history. Um, we all have habits and we've developed relationships and the executives in the bigger companies didn't start yesterday, so they came up through the ranks and depending on which way they came up, there was um, the perception that marketing is more professional than sales and, and sales w you know, wasn't treated as a profession. Um, marketing's got a lot more art to it and it's, you know, it was always painted as more fun, but those yeah. were the days when you know, everybody's uh, caught up in Mad Men. Those days are gone. You know, it's not branding about what you want to people to think of you, it's what they think of you and based on their experience. And your sales force is your experience if you're B2B and that's where I've been most of my time. So, so then fast forward to why is it important to change because it's not working anymore. The, you know, f with sales and marketing going off doing two different things, it's terribly inefficient. You can't um, be effective, you're wasting money. And you know, after 2009, no one's wasting money anymore on you know, marketing that can be measured. It's, it's interesting that you bring up measurement because that's one of the things you talk about Mad Men. Marketing up until even when I was early on in my career was very much the gut instinct of a few very creative, talented individuals, and yet sales was always able to be measured. You knew if you made X amount of calls in a certain period of time, you were going to get you know two to three opportunities, and out of that you might close one deal, and so those metrics were always in place. Perhaps that's what's changed. Perhaps that suddenly marketing and all these activities that go along with marketing can now suddenly be measured what's your take on that yeah I think that's a lot of it and the the other part is that they are experiencing competition for eyes that they never had before you would be you know coming out of a world where maybe there'd be three major brands and that's all you really have to worry about now it's a huge number and people are just assaulted with content all the time so you know you have to really differentiate and you know look at me isn't doing it anymore Ray, I really like to get into this interview today. Uh, tell me first a little bit about your background. How did you move into sales? I am one of the last accidental salesmen. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do well in college and ended up having to go work in a warehouse uh, because I didn't finish my degree. And fortunately, the sales manager of the company at the time said, you know, there's, you seem to be a little smarter than the average guy that's unloading train cars for us. Would you like to uh, to be a salesperson? At the time, it was really the lowest level of sales. It was route sales, where I was going around and 
measuring how much you had on the shelves and asking if you want to replenish that. So uh, I didn't start, you know, in sales by intent, which I think, you know, I, I, that's why I love working with the sales center because you can now. Yeah, that's a that's a big difference too. I too, like my first job out of college, uh, I graduated with an organizational communication degree long enough to go, what do you do with that? And so obviously the default was getting into sales. You on the other hand have done sales for a lot of major organizations, Standard Register, BI, uh, and probably a variety of in between. Talk a little bit about your career path in terms of working in sales for some of these large organizations. What were What were the big wins and challenges along the way? Really, it was just learning from everybody that I would encounter. I mean, I really was fortunate to have worked for a number of different managers early in my career that had different styles, and I was able to take what they did well and uh, and bring that into my own style, if you will. Um, learn, you know, on the job, but also having really uh, close relationships, so I got immediate feedback. A, a lot of you know, working with someone that you didn't go too far down the road without some correction if that was necessary. Um, it also was a different time when, you know, the, the training courses were long. You know, we weren't, you know, there wasn't so much pressure to, for time ramping up that we could take three weeks for a training class. That would be unheard of today. Yeah, it, it seems like things move really, really fast, and a lot of that trading is happening with you know feet on the ground while you're also trying to to close that first you know one or two deals to get yourself a foundation. Uh, with these big organizations, and and I think a lot of people in the audience have heard this, there has historically been a disconnect between the marketing organization and the sales organization. I would go as far as to even say animosity between those two departments. We've talked a little bit about why that is, but what war stories do you have? What are some experiences that you've seen where that, that disconnect was really the case? Well, I think early in my career when you start moving into reps that had account assignments that had maybe a major account or two, you would feel that you owned that account or you'd work with a salesperson that would say, you know, I'm calling on you know, this company and no one should touch it except me. And that creates some animosity marketing because that's their fodder for case studies. And they wanted information. They want to be able to trade on that. You know, everybody has the big logo page they put in their PowerPoints and they wanted to include that one. And the salesperson would think, well, that's my intellectual capital and that's my claim to fame. And so you'd build some hostility there. Um, marketing sometimes go in off without checking with you would get that started. So it was that that collaboration, which really is just basics um, that it, it was more, rather than sales and marketing, I think it was just poor leadership in, yeah. in order to set expectations that we're, we cooperate and here's what a team looks like. And that started to change when you had team selling because you know, the, the lone wolf uh, doesn't work anymore. You have to sell in a team, especially in the complex B2B world. So that kind of had to break down because if you're uh, offending everybody when you're going down the hallway, it's likely that your customer's service isn't going to be the best either. So that changed a little bit. It's interesting you mentioned the lone wolf because these are the you know sales executives who had built up years and years and years of business and had these Rolodexes that you might as well have you know put wheels on and driven around town. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, enter in something called LinkedIn, where now anybody can has that have that size of a Rolodex, even as a young sales professional. So in terms of, of how sales has changed, what has social media and social networking done to really kind of level the playing field, if you will? Well, it's, it's, it's democratized a lot of things that you would used to depend on marketing for. Um, marketing held the keys to research, to creating content, to creating branded pieces that if you wanted to hand out to someone. And, and, and that also was you know, the start of some of the conflict because marketing will complain that there's all this bootleg material out there. Who did that? Well, sales did it because they had a meeting tomorrow and marketing couldn't come up with the content fast enough, so I did it myself. Yeah. And I would rather, you know, you always hear better to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, that doesn't start off a very good relationship. Now, salespeople can find that information on their own, and they went really from a, a drought 
to a deluge because you know I couldn't find information about my customer. It was knocking on doors. It was you know a lot of talk about you know the golf course. Well, the golf course a lot of times was how you found out when an organization structure was changing, who's going to leave, um, and now you can find that out really quickly. And and you, you can even with the software tools now set up. Uh, alerts to find out when people are going to move and you can often find if people are connecting to recruiters you know more often that they're likely suspect and if that's your prime and only contact and account you better get busy so um, that's been part of it and I find that now that's shifted what the salespeople focus on because I used to focus on knowing my product and being the expert in that because that's what you came to me for now you can find that out through all the work that marketing does and putting it out, you know, in readily available form that I can find and search for. So you don't need me for that, but you do need me for insights and how would I apply it to my business and, and what really makes you different from other opportunities I could do. And I don't mean just my competition, but other ways I could spend my money, period, is at the best. And, and you need to be an advisor so you have this information now that you need to deliver at the right time. And that's the thing I think that is the, the one moment is that moment of relevance for a client and a purchase and or a, an account to start paying attention. And what marketing wants to know what that is because they can't afford to uh, waste a lot of marketing effort, yeah. collateral and time if it's not relevant. So salespeople can help tell when it's relevant by setting their alerts for trigger events, and they can actually alert marketing that this is going on in my account. What do you have for that? Then marketing can say, this is the time for them to get this campaign, or let's invite them to the, to an event. Let's make sure that they have um, the, the commercial teaching, I guess, if you want, about um, why this is beneficial and get them thinking about us. And, and that's where you need, really need to share, because salespeople, I think we're involved too late in the process before. There's an interesting stat that's flown around on the web from the corporate executive board, and albeit this has come under some fire, but in B2B sales, uh, this report states that 57% of the buyer's journey is completed before the buyer ever talks to a sales representative. Now, what that means essentially then is that the role of the sales representative who used to hold all the cards to the information and be able to release that information at the time when it was right for the sale, that's now flipped upside down where the consumer now has the majority of the information they need to close themselves on a deal before they ever talk to a sales representative. What does that do to the sales representative from not just a philosophy and mentality state, but also from an education perspective? How do they, how do you as a sales representative prepare for this new environment? Yeah, and that statistics I've I've seen from 57 to upwards of 70, 75, you know, 67% of statistics are made up. Yeah. So um, it doesn't really matter what it is. We just know it's huge that, you know, in, in this time. So they are well informed about your product and your service. The difference is that you have to know when they're really thinking about it. And sometimes you can get them thinking about it if you send content that's relevant. And if it sounds like, buy my product, my product is better than the competition, then I turn it off and I don't look at it. If it's, how could I be better in my business, I'm going to open that email. So it's positioning that, and sales can tell you when that's going to happen. Uh, to quote Stan Lee, and I've used this multiple different interviews, so I apologize to the audience for doing this, but with great power comes great responsibility. And inbound marketing in itself with the technologies have given sales associates, especially with the dawn of, of the new CRMs, a lot of really relevant information. And yet, sometimes sales representatives can operate too quickly. They can have a knee-jerk reaction to the information that they have available. How do you prevent that? As a sales professional, how do you know when it is the right time to act on the information that you have and when it's time to let something cook? That's a bit of experience and art. Uh, There's plenty of different scoring techniques in some of the inbound marketing tools that can give you some direction, but it's more like a a weather vane than it is uh, a speedometer. It's telling you this might be the right time and 
Uh, so the sales reps are in control of that, and I think what they can do is then start to um, launch a personal message in the midst of a campaign, for instance, to say, you know, something happened. We just found out there was an infusion of capital. Uh, we just found that they won an award. We've learned that they their, their stock moved up, and that creates some pressure, and you can ping them with some information and a personal inquiry rather than let your, your regular campaign roll. So essentially you're talking about both the power of the brand behind the marketing campaign, but also the individual sales representative's brand as a human being. Right. And, and I think it also, uh, the, the responsibility comes in the sales leadership training the team on what's appropriate. Because just because there are scoring methodologies out there doesn't mean that you should just launch. I'll give you an example. I, I was looking at a white paper online and I got an inbound call from a salesperson saying, I, I want to talk to you about uh, what you learned. And I'm, I'm going, you jumped on this. And I okay. know that you can tell I'm on your website right now. That's not the time to call me. I don't care if my lead score is off the charts. It's still not relevant. I haven't even read the white paper yet. Um, figure out how to understand when it is relevant and look for those trigger events. You might have been better served uh, researching my company and finding a trend that you could then launch an email in a couple days or, or you know even that same day might be okay but that's the, the the training the opportunity the coaching and a bit of the art because people will find that I launched you know a campaign and this person responded uh, but they asked me a question off of the campaign rather than it's time to go into a sales pitch. So it's a very thin line between relevant and creepy. <laughs> yeah, if you will. absolutely. So kind of wrapping this up, we've talked a lot about, you know, really interesting connections today. If you were a marketing manager, even a sales manager, what advice do you leave the, the corporate business professional who's dealing with this in terms of how to create the connection between sales and marketing in their organization? Think as of your sales and marketing group like any other organization in your company that has a focus on the customer first, and you have a continuous improvement loop that you should engage. So um, if marketing is, is visiting with sales, I have a friend that's a VP of sales, he made a call with his salespeople, he found a use of their product that was unique and it turned into a whole value proposition that he could then promote and sell to an entirely new segment. He never would have found that out if the salesperson had that hold off, you're, I mean, you're not coming to my accounts. So he came in in a non-threatening way and listened and he didn't you know, jump on anything and he didn't push him too hard. So they, they you know, became partners there. And then once that happened, and the, and the sales rep found that you, you know, it really was helpful to him or her, then you know, that relationship just continued to fuel. So it's, and, it, and it's like any, whether you're Six Sigma or whatever, continuous improvement, you'll know that it's you know, test and learn and then come back and validate what you learned out of it. So I would say cooperate, find those moments of relevance and really focus on that. And I'm, I've been discerning this for a couple months, and I'll, maybe we'll have a sequel, but I'd like to even change the language. I think lead um, might need to be changed because it's not necessarily a lead. It's making a friendship or attracting someone at the right time, yeah. and you're working together to make that happen. The lead implies I'm tossing it to you, and you have to deal with it. And that really is brings us back to where did the conflict started from because it's exactly that. I gave you this. I'm, I'm taking credit for it. I you see. deal with it. And then, you know, I've got all my excuses why it didn't work out, so it doesn't start out. I th I'd like to think of it more as, you know, are we working for the common good of the client and, and realizing that the more people we know and the better we know their business, it's better for them too. So lead, and, and I think some of the, and we've talked about it before, the, the war-like terms don't, yeah. don't really uh, make sense. And, targeting, prospecting, yeah. flanking strategies, all of that. Um, it's going to be a lot of uh, language change for me, for sure. No, and that's good. I mean, hopefully, you know, when that language changes, it'll, it'll change to something that's much more friendly and relationship-driven, because who doesn't like that? 
So this is, uh, this is the Columbus Marketing Show, and we would be remiss to not mention what day we're recording this on, but we record these shows on Monday, and tonight the Ohio State University Buckeyes will be playing the Oregon Ducks in the national championship. By the time this episode is out, the game will be well over, and we will either be in tears licking our wounds, or we will still be partying because the OSU Buckeyes just won the national title. So I have to ask you this. What is your prediction on the spread for... Monday night's game? Uh, well, you know, I think our Buckeyes always uh, give us heart attacks and strokes and everything. So I think it's, certainly in the first half it's going to be close and they might even be behind. But I think they'll, they'll um, be up by two touchdowns when the final gun goes off. Okay, so two touchdowns from Ray. I'm, I'm going to go even farther because, again, I, I, I look back to uh, two weeks ago now's game uh, against the Alabama defense, and uh, that was a close one, but I really think that we're going to run three up on the Ducks. So <laughs> we'll, we'll keep this as a gentleman's <laughs> bet and see who actually comes out, and hopefully we're both not in tears. Yes, yeah, exactly. So thank you very much for being a guest on the show. Uh, Ray Taylor, independent sales and marketing consultant. Uh, glad to have you with us. Thanks, Nate. Cisco estimates that by 2018, video will represent 79% of all internet traffic. Take your marketing program to the next level by engineering video content libraries that are strategically designed to drive traffic, convert customers, and build lasting brand loyalty. Get a sneak peek of the Video Engineering Playbook, a new book by Nate Riggs, Download your free sample chapters by clicking this link. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for today. My special thanks to Ray Taylor for being a guest on this week's show. Come back next week. We're going to be talking with Dr. Raj Agnihorte from Ohio University on the school's new Consumer Research Center as well as their research fellowship program. Going to be very interesting stuff coming from Athens, Ohio. The Columbus Marketing Show is a production of NR Media Group. We record this live in our studios down on 454 East Main Street in downtown Columbus. Come down and visit us at any time. A quick reminder that NR Media Group is facilitating the first Columbus HubSpot user group meeting, and that is coming up Wednesday, January 28th. It is a free event. We will have cat singers for lunch, so please come and join us for that. We will be taking a deep dive into HubSpot's new CRM tool, which is free for all HubSpot users. You're going to want to check out that discussion. Watch the show on YouTube. It is on the NR Media Group YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash NR Media Group, all one word. You can find it on the playlist of the Columbus Marketing Show, and it'll be at the very top of our videos for that week. Listen to the show on spreaker.com forward slash show forward slash the Columbus Marketing Show, or you can find us on iTunes. Catch this week's show notes on the post on nrmedia.biz. And special thanks to the NR Media Group production crew, Nate Marshall, the production director, Alex Foley, uh, content manager, Chris Summers, audio engineer, and Melissa Christian, executive administrator, for all her help in booking guests and the logistics of the show. And as always, I am your host, Nate Riggs, and I will see you back here next Friday, starting at 6 a.m., with another episode of the Columbus Marketing Show.